All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Saturday Night Live Zoom webinar. Uh, this week, we're talking about hospitality management post COVID 19. And I have with me, as with every week, an esteemed group of speakers. First up, we have Azam Jamil from the batch of 1970. Azam is a senior consultant for Devta Punjab, Akhwat, Franklin Kobe, Pakistan, and Collabs. He is the former head of Hashu School of Hospitality Management. Next up, we have Naki Abbas from the batch of 2002. Naki is managing partner and CEO of Cavalry Greens and has over 15 years of experience at Global Hyatt in the Middle East. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. So thank you for having both of us. Thanks, Ahmed. You're welcome, sir. So our schedule for today is that we will be having a discussion with the speakers for about 35 minutes, after which we'll have a QA and a session with the audience for the last 25 minutes. Okay. Please bear with me. So my first question is for Azam Jamil Saab, and it is, how were you introduced to the field of hospitality management? Please briefly tell us about your career journey after your time at Aitson College. Uh, I, uh, ob obviously after Aitson, I went to university and when I got back, um, I was wanting to just do nothing. That was the dream. And uh, I was a national tennis player. So I was, you know, I was Pakistan's national tennis champion. I was a musician. I used to play in a rock band. So, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was work for a living. And um, I was playing tennis at the, at the Sin Club and Air Marshal Noor Khan uh, used to come and play with me. And he, one day he asked me, he said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. And he said, what do you mean nothing? Because to a Fauji, this word nothing, you know, is blasphemous. And... And uh, I said, I'm doing nothing. And he says, uh, tomorrow morning, my office, nine o'clock. And uh, he was the chairman of PSL as well as chairman of Intercontinental Hotels. And PSL was the owning company of the Intercontinental Hotels, which was, um, those were managed properties. So I then reported for duty at PSL. Um, and that was the start of the hospitality journey. Uh, connected with intercontinental hotels and I never looked back. So that was, that was how I started. That's really interesting. Thank you, Azam Saab. Uh, I'd like to take the same question to Naki Abbas. Basically similar. Um, I was at home. I finished after it's in, uh, my father was because he was in the army. So he got posted to Rahul Pindi. So uh, I had to move back. I had to leave it from the boarding and I went back and I did my A levels from St. Mary's Pindi in Lalaza. Uske baad, I was, uh, I'd applied for the military. I was very fascinated. So I wanted to, you know, take up, uh, I, I was waiting for my call for PMA Kakul. And uh, in the meantime, I was at home. So my father was very upset that why are you sitting at home? So he decided to send me to an internship at Pearl Continental in Rahul Pindi. So at that time, Shakil Saab used to be the general manager there. And, uh, and then I had an opportunity of doing an internship there for six months, which I found it to be very fascinating. And eventually things did not work out. Uh, unfortunately, in the military academy, I had a very uh, bad accident during training due to which I had to leave the academy. And then once I came back, uh, my father was posted to Lahore. Then I decided to do an internship in Pearl Continental Lahore for about a year, where uh, I had some nice advice in my, from the management there. We used to have a general manager there who was from Europe. So he guided me through, okay, you should, how you can make it into a career. I completed a one-year management training there at Pearl Continental Lahore. And then from there, I decided to go to Glion to complete my bachelor's uh, from Switzerland. That's really interesting as well, Naki Saab. Thank you so much for answering that in so much depth. Um, my next question is you know, for you again. It is, uh, when you started out in your careers, what was your day-to-day -day work like? Did hospitality management entail a lot of attention to detail? Uh, Naki Abbas Saab first for this question. I personally feel, you know, over the, uh, over the course of time that I've spent with Middle East and mostly with Hyatt as well, attention to detail, obviously, I think that's one of the most fundamental parts of our job. Also, I think uh, at a later stage of our career, we realize that, you know, we need to strike a good uh, work and life balance. 
hospitality i feel that i know it's a it's a very demanding industry again whether you're working in as an admin or you're working in hr or whether you're working in operations it it requires a lot and primarily it's because unlike other organizations i think the hotel never closes it's operating 24 hours so usle has say i think it's very very demanding it's challenging and uh, so day to day life i remember mostly was spent at work honestly i i used to remember before any i was as a single person most of my time was actually spent at at the hotel you know i used to probably just come home have dinner and go to sleep and that's about it shaadi ke baad obviously it was a bit difficult initially it was quite challenging but i think ma- mainly it's like a day to day mena it's very demanding your body takes a good toll on it and you know you need to be pleasant your customer service whether you're dealing with employees or you're dealing with guests at both time you have to be very very you know sharp and you have to be on top of your game hmm. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, Azam sir, same question for you. What was day to day work like when you started out? The first thing I'm at is a cultural shock. Uh, you know, uh, you walk into the, the hotel and you've got this uh, fabulous picture of you uh, dressed up in a suit and speaking to pretty women in the lobby, and it takes you very very quickly to realize that that's not happening. and and they shove you back in the kitchen or in housekeeping or in laundry or up in the rooms so like any other job it's a it's a real you know it brings you very close to reality uh and like nakki said you know when people ask me about hospitality my answer is that if you want to enter this career come with a lot of patience uh it requires a lot of patience i mean there's no quick fix and unlike other industries amit hospitality is interesting because it's selling multiple businesses under one roof and these businesses are not connected to each other you know uh, you are selling a chicken tikka and you are washing a suit and dry cleaning a suit now these two businesses have nothing to do with each other um, now there's a gym and there's a swimming pool and that has nothing to do with these two then you're selling rooms and you're selling food so it's a it's a multiple business area and you need to be familiar with all these businesses you obviously get posted to one department but uh, they realize that if there's potential in you that sooner or later you will achieve a higher position and you will be looking after more than one department and that's what happened in my career you know i ended up being looking after a hotel and then when you look after a hotel you have to look after um the entire hotel you you know one minute the laundry manager will come to you and talk about a chemical and the next minute the chef will come to you and talk about the spice and and you need to deal with both of these uh, issues so uh, very interesting but requires a lot of patience and uh, you start at you know there's it's a it's a real bottom up approach you can't sort of descend by helicopter at uh, camp 3 on k2 you know you just need to go to base camp first and you need to acclimatize get used and slowly climb your way up so that's what my comment is on this a uh, very insightful azam sir thank you so much uh, my next question is about the covid-19 pandemic and its onset um with the onset of the covid-19 pandemic several hotel chains are closing down and facing severe losses do you think that this trend will change in the near future and that the hotel industry will once again generate uh, pre covid profits i'd like to go to nakhi bas sahab first for this see uh, first of all i think it will matter from area region to region thoda sa different impact hoga um, i personally take like for example if i take the example of saudi so when we were in 2020 makka was he- heavily impacted where i was based there and uh, again a, a good recovery or a decent recovery was done in 2021 um i think definitely losses hain i remember hum log ka jo ceo tha for hiat you know he called all the general managers and the top management people of all the hotels and he said you know this pandemic has really severely impacted us as well and usme ye hai ki bhi the most important thing is that it's all about survival first of all secondly uh, recovery also there's going to be a change already there's a change in trend and shift is that people i think will not be likely to go and spend more time in five star hotels so for example if you look at pakistan hotel one is a concept which has been introduced quite some time back now each and every hotel chain whether it's four season whether it's higher to marriott they've come up with their own which is called you press the wrong button nahi nahi nah, i was not pressing anything but something just went out <laughs> <laughs> oh no worries we'll miss the background but you know we can 
Never mind. Maybe put it back. I still have it. I yeah. still have it. Yeah, at least Azam Sab still has it. <laughs> ah, yes. That, uh, well, I think there's some, something went wrong there. Uh, so coming back to the topic again, yes. So, so select service is something which is the future. If you look at uh, China, if you look at India, a lot of these countries, the companies are invested into that because it's it's affordable staying. And Airbnb obviously will have a have a major impact on the software. Well. So that is one thing that is definitely there. Recovery ki jo baat karte hai, I think personally, I think not before 2023. We cannot say that before because jab tak travel impacted hai, the industry is going to definitely have an impact as well. I was just reading an article ke bhi, now people have a shift of traveling towards destinations where it's more about leisure. So that those areas, I think, can definitely benefit out of it. Uh, the rest, I think, will definitely have a, a huge impact on that. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, Azam Saab, same question to you about uh, COVID-19 and its effect on the hotel industry. Ahmed, uh, the hotel industry, even pre-COVID, is a very fragile industry. Uh, anything happens in a city, uh, anything untowards, uh, the hotels are the first thing to suffer. Because uh, the first reaction, the gut reaction is people stop traveling. So inherently, it's a fragile uh, industry. And then when COVID hits you, then that fragility is exposed. And then uh, you realize that nobody's coming. Um, COVID uh, told people one thing, and the message was clear, that don't clutter around in groups. You know, numbers were dangerous. And hotels are nothing but numbers. You know, uh, the lobby is full, the banquet halls are full, the restaurants are full. So by the nature of the business is that it is number dependent. And when you are told that numbers is not good, then obviously you will suffer more than anybody else will. Uh, and uh, hotels are suffering very badly around the world, some more than others. And like Naki said, uh, economy hotels have a higher chance of surviving for no other reason, uh, their costs are managed. You know, the PC Lahore um, is, is not a hotel, it's a city, you know, and, and trying to manage the cost of PC Lahore is, is a nightmare, you know. So, uh, yes, when, when times are good, your revenues go through the roof. Um, but when times are bad, then the costs hit you. So yes, uh, there will be recovery, but we are connected with COVID. And uh, if somebody were to tell me today when COVID will end, I will very safely and gladly predict, predict the hotel recovery period to you right now. But the, the problem is that as soon as one wave goes, some wave out of the blues comes and hits us, and then we are back to square one. Um, COVID is here to stay. I don't know how long it will stay. As long as it stays in some shape or form, hotels will keep suffering. They will have periods of some recovery and then something will happen and the lockdown will come and then everybody will go south. So yes, it's, uh, it's very difficult to predict, but these are very, very difficult times. Thank you so much for that, Ji. I have a related question next, um, which is, how do you think hotels will adapt to a post-pandemic world? Now that you have mentioned that you know, COVID is here to stay, will hotel stays become expensive? What do you think uh, are the precautions which hotel managers would take to ensure safe and enjoyable services for their clients? Me or Naki? Uh, you first and then Naki, sir. Okay. okay. When I, I was CEO of Hashu Group when COVID hit. And uh, I was uh, with them for about six to seven months post-COVID. And in those six, six and seven months, we saw dramatic changes in guest offering. Uh, immediately, hygiene becomes your top selling item. Okay, immediately. So it's no longer the chicken tikka. It's no longer the ambience. It's no longer the, the vestibule elevator or the fountains in the lobby. It just becomes hygiene. And uh, Hashu, a group where I was connected, took immediate measures. Uh, one of the measures they took, Ahmed, was they had an expat director of hygiene. 
And for the first time, I'd heard of this uh, designation within Pakistan. And this lady came and she took the bull by the horns and she just took the hygiene levels to a different level. Now, let me tell you an example of what they do, um, that if you enter into a Pearl Continental room, it looks like you've bought everything new. The remote is fat in a plastic covering like you would take it out of the box. And you actually, with the scissors, cut the, cut the plastic and you use the remote. So you get this feeling that you are the first user, although you're not, but it's sanitized and it's packed. The, the menu is sanitized and it's packed. Everything, the level of hygiene has gone to another level. So all hotels will need to up their hygiene profile, uh, even post COVID. Uh, I don't know about uh, Florida, but in Pakistan, you know, we survive around buffets. Everywhere there's a buffet, you, you know, that's our life. And, and what does a buffet mean? Inherently, uh, buffet is not very hygienic because you have more than one person uh, using the same chafing dish and you, you know, everybody's shadis, for example, our weddings have 1200 people and everybody is putting the spoon in the same chicken curry. So you will need to redesign this, okay? What the Marriott did was that they first minimized their buffet and then they had a cook or a chef stand behind each chef English. So when you came with the plate, you didn't handle the food. All you did was put the plate forward and this chef, uh, fully gloved and you know, looking very, very uh, medical, he used to put the food in your plate. So, you know, these are just trial and error. People are trying to make it, uh, uh, you know, to make it work. Um, the other thing that will impact business is that we suddenly discovered Zoom. You know, imagine the kind of traveling I used to do pre-Zoom. For a half an hour meeting, I used to fly to Karachi, right? And I used to be back the same day. And suddenly people said, hey, you know, what's this baby? And people don't realize that Zoom was introduced in, the, in April of 2011. And we discovered it only when COVID hit. Uh, nobody cared about Zoom, but now everybody knows. So at least 15, 20% of meetings that people used to travel back and forth are going to be done on Zoom. Surely there'll be 70% of meetings that require face-to-face intervention, and those will happen. But in every way, uh, businesses will fall. Like Naki said, that uh, you will try to do your business from home, but leisure you can't do from home. So you will still take your family to the mountains, to Natya Gali, you know. So the leisure travel will, like Pakistan has shown, leisure travel has not shown a drop. The business travel has shown a drop. So that's my two cents on that. Uh, thank you so much for those insights. Uh, Naki sahab, do you have any comments to add? Uh, just a few. Adam sahab has very nicely summarized most of them and he's touched most of the points. So one thing which has actually which has occurred worldwide globally is the addition of the hygiene manager. So in Middle East, outside properties who could afford easily would have an hygiene manager, but it was not a, it was not a necessity at that time. It was not mandatory. Now that has become mandatory. Secondly, there has been a change now in amenity. So before amenity focus would be on, you know, nice food baskets, nice chocolate. Now the amenity focus is to have a sanitization check. Okay, so you need a mask, you need to have sanitary things involved. A temperature check has to be there. So that is there. You come to the restaurant, paperless menu, QR codes. Okay, so that completely has that start off. Now chains are also investing in saying, okay, you don't need to come in person to the reception because reception again, as I mentioned, the hotel is again a very high volume traffic area. So the reception is the first point of contact. So now there's no requirement to go in person. You can do an online check-in. Keys, mobile keys now can be, so your key can be in your mobile phone and you use your mobile phone when you go to your room and that becomes automatically your key card, right? Uh, mobile ordering, takeaway, uh, in-room delivery, um, these are the new changes that is going to heavily impact now. And that is what guests are looking for. So if hotels want people to come in, they want guests to come in. These are the practices that need to be adapt adopted. Yes, it will cost the hotels a lot, 
no doubt about it. But that is the only way moving forward. If you want for customers to be comfortable, if you want them that they should feel satisfied that the equipment, the amenities, what they're using are completely sanitized, and then they're able to, you know, that's the only way hotels can actually make sure that guests are going to come back. Really appreciate that, Naki Saab. Thank you so much. And uh, my next question is for Azam Jamil Saab. Uh, you're a corporate trainer and inspirational speaker, and were formerly a national sportsman. Uh, did your hospitality management career play a role in developing all these interests or vice versa? Like, do you, are there any skills which are transferable from uh, such a career? Just hard work. I think hospitality teaches you to rough it out. I used to, when I used to play tennis, I used to wake up at, uh, you know, 4.35 and train for two and a half hours and then arrive at the hotel for the morning briefing. And then after my day was over, all my colleagues used to go home and say, Ami bhook lagi hai. And I used to go back to the, to the training uh, for training. And I used to arrive home at, you know, at 7.38. And then it, and this is what I did year after year after year. So yes, hospitality teaches you that, like Naki said initially, that it's uh, once the hotel is made, it will not shut down until it's demolished. Okay. And until it's demolished, you need to uh, run it. And the junior you are, the, the worse the timing shifts you get. That's, that's how it works, right? So as you get senior, you start, people start respecting you. So uh, tennis, I used to play pre and post. Of course, when I used to, I had to go abroad to represent, uh, represent Pakistan in tournaments abroad. So then uh, the hotel used to be very kind and give me special leave. So I was privileged from that point of view that other than my earned leave, I was allowed to go play for the Federation. So, so that, that, that helped and uh, uh, that was the sports side. Anything else that I did, and I did a lot of other things also, um, uh, didn't really interfere uh, with sports. My speaking did not start... Um, till about uh, late 70s uh, or early 80s. So I'd spent about six or seven years in the hotel before I started going out and speaking. And that also happened by total accident, but it started off. And then I've been training people since, and I've been speaking to people since. It's been 30 years now. And um, mercifully, whichever organization I did work for, they never stopped me from training outside of the hotel. I worked for Serena Hotels and the Aga Khan Developer Network never stopped me from training at Nestle or training Unilever or anywhere else I went. They said, as long as you're imparting knowledge, you go ahead and do it. Uh, the only thing was that I didn't train at any other hotel because that was a direct conflict of interest. So no, the hotel really didn't stop me. It just became very tiring because, uh, like Naki said, that there's no day and there's no you know, there's no end. Um, and they used to ask me, "What are your work timings?" And I used to say, "From nine to never." And that's uh, and that's fairly accurate. It is from nine to never. And but you find time. You know, people said that. How did you find time? And it's tough, but you do find time. Depends on how passionate you are. Amit. If you're not passionate, of course, you'll find an excuse. You know, I had a bad day at work. I'm, I've done a double shift or whatever. But if you are passionate about anything, you will find a way. That is so uh, enlightening. Thank you so much, Adam Saab. Uh, my next question is for Nakia Basab. Uh, Nakia Saab, please tell us more about your new venture, Cavalry Greens, which you have founded here in Lahore, Pakistan. We'd love to know more about it. So it was, it was a very hard step for me to come back home to Pakistan almost after 17 years. Uh, and I only worked for Hyatt uh, most of my career. But obviously, uh, I saw a scope there that, okay, then Pakistan, you know, hospitality is growing, trend is growing, people are traveling. Uh, so Cavalry Greens basically is a, a family project which was always there. Uh, it was basically land which we had developed. And uh, now uh, my role coming here is that we are designing a community. Uh, it's a small community. We uh, Sometimes people are asking me, are you, are you trying to become the next uh, barrier or something? I said, no, it's not like that. Cavalry Green is basically a community living that we want to, uh, we want to uh, introduce in Pakistan. So we are offering lands for plotting. So people can design houses, farmhouses there, and uh, houses also as well. We have a small little golf course for three holes. 
which is there for the community members who are living there. And so the next step, what we are going to do is that we are going to start building apartments uh, in two bedroom, three bedroom, four bed bedroom apartments in a nice gated community. Uh, and the Cavalry Greens, because my father being from the military, so that's where the name Cavalry comes from. Uh, it's all lush greens environment and society. What we are currently also doing is that we are also leasing it out for events. So we don't have a marquee. However, uh, we have signed contracts with uh, catering companies as well as events company who would like to come and, you know, to take a charge, we charge the venue rental and then they are coming and doing the events over there, whether it's indoor and outdoors, now focusing more towards outdoor events. We plan to also add a clubhouse for the residents who are going to be there living in the apartments as well as the houses. We have about five, six houses which have been constructed already. Uh, then at a later stage, uh, I plan to design a, a restaurant as well also there, which is, which is going to come in, in the due course of time as well. And we also want to add a hospital and a school as well. My my uh, my inspiration is to have a hotel school ideally because I feel that in Pakistan I think there is a huge demand in the future. It might be an idea, but that's why I wanted to you know future discuss with Adam Saab as well what are the possibilities in Pakistan to have a hotel school and so on. So basically, it's providing a community living, a gated community, and to add on some services there as well. So I think that's moving forward. That's what Cavalry is all about. All the best with your new venture, Naki Saab. Thank you so much. Uh, now my last question uh, for this event, it's for both panelists and we'll start with Azam Jamil Saab first. What advice do you have for young Gitisonians interested in hospitality management careers? What are some of the skills that students would require to excel in the field? Okay, uh, before I answer that question, I need to clarify uh, the word hospitality. Uh, very often, it's misunderstood to be hotel management. It's not, it's not anymore. Uh, hospitality is a very, very wide area. Um, responding to what Naki just said, I'm opening two hospitality schools in Pakistan as we speak. One is opening next month, uh, the Akhubat Hospitality School, and one is in Murray, which I am uh, opening for Tevta. Uh, so two hospitality schools are opening and this entails a lot of skill impartation uh, other than hotels, okay? First of all, there is a huge element of tourism in this, okay? Uh, there's an element of uh, real hospitality includes even hospital management, airline management, shopping mall management. You know, Disneyland is hospitality. So uh, airline management, so it's, it's a very wide field. Uh, let me share a statistic with you. The Aga Khan Hospital in Karachi makes more meals per day than the Marriott and the PC put together. So that's the volume of hospitality in a hospital. And so you can imagine their back end uh, supply chain, their chefs, their kitchen. Uh, it's just everywhere now. You go to a shopping mall in Pakistan, in Lahore or Karachi, um, you know, Dukane kam hai, food court mein, restaurants yada hai, you know. So there's hospitality everywhere. Uh, I had a meeting with when Asim Bajwa was heading CPAC, he called me and he said he needs 3,000 kids who are hospitality trained. So Naki should definitely think of a hospitality school and very quickly, it's not that difficult to do. And we can, and it can be started off with relatively, uh, you know, moderate investment. And it's easy to do. And that's what I'm doing these days. I'm just opening one hospitality school because I know these kids are going to get adjusted somewhere. So that's that's what I wanted to clarify on hospitality. My advice to HSONians or any uh, um, youngster is that, uh, you know, you need to like people for this business. If you don't like people, become an accountant. Do not become a hospitality person. You just need to love people, genuinely love people. You need to have a genuine smile. You need to wake up in the morning happy. You know, imagine getting up disgruntled, coming to work and then having to smile in front of, you know, people all day long. It doesn't work. So you just need to be, uh, you know, when, we, uh, when I was leaving uh, Serena, uh, one of the uh, methods we chose to hire kids was that we used to walk into a university and we stopped looking at grades. Grades were no longer a qualifying matter. We used to go and ask the teacher of the graduating class, 
identify four kids who were most respectful to you in the last two years. And he used to identify the four kids and they were at work the next morning. I mean, those guys have a hospitality DNA in them. You know, what will I do with grades? What will I do with the 3.9 GPA? But if some kid is, you know, genuinely respectful to the teacher, can you imagine what the same kid will do when he gets paid to be respectful? I mean, he's going to get to a different level. So yeah, you need to be a happy person. You need to be, and of course, you need to be a passionate person. And uh, like I said, at the beginning of the program, you need to be patient, okay? If you are expecting, uh, you know, big cars and all this fancy stuff when you join hospitality, it's not happening. It's not happening in most jobs, but in hospitality, it's definitely not happening. And, uh, but eventually you'll get there. And once you make it to senior management and hospitality, then, then it's really, it's really fa a fairy tale. So that's my advice to all age Sonians. Azam Saab, thank you so much. Uh, your answer makes me want to switch careers. So <laughs> deeply uh -huh. appreciate it. Uh, Naki Saab, uh, same question to you. Do you have any advice for young age Sonians? The most important thing is that they need to be sure if somebody wants to make a career in hospitality. I mean, uh, at that time, I, mean, I also especially joined, there was not much uh, career advice at that time because there was a lack of awareness as well. My rapid mentality thi, ke ji, uh, hospitality mein ja rahe to be, okay, you're going to be a waiter or you're going to be a bowel. Okay? Hospitality is way much more than that. Yes, as Adam Saab said, ke bhi, you have to start from small. I, I remember very clearly ke bhi, PC Lahore mein, in the morning I used to be coming and I used to be you know cleaning rooms. And in the evening, I would probably come in the evening and have a dinner with my with my father in the restaurant. Okay? So the thing is, up in your mind, you need to be making sure that nothing is small. Okay? You want to succeed in this career, you have to start from the very basics. Okay? Whether it's working in a laundry, whether it's working in housekeeping, whether it's working as a waiter, or even uh, working as a kitchen or as a steward. Okay? That, is, that is the most important thing. Secondly, it is good to go to a hotel school. If they, they should select a good school where they can actually go and like, you know, specialize and study and do a good internship as well. So, you know, so that so you get a nice uh, feel of what the hotel industry as well. And most important thing is expectation level should be very low because what happens is, for example, at Cornell or uh, even in Leon or Echo Hotel, Lausanne, these are schools. So when students go there, they're like, okay, we finished the hotel school, we're going to become a manager tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. You start from a very basic position if you're lucky. And from there, you have to go up slowly, slowly, slowly. Hospitality and industry requires a lot of time, endurance, patience. And compared to, let's say, like Adam Saab said, if you, if you become an accountant, you become an engineer. Um, financially, hospitality industry globally does not pay you that well compared to the other industry. But the level of output and work that is required is way much more because the number of hours, number of commitment as well. So someone who really wants to make a career should be very clear from day one, KB, this is what it is. It's a very promising career. At the end, if you are really able to manage and you know make it to the ranks, you will succeed. You will do, do wonderful uh, and very well in life. And eventually you can go and, you know, hospitality is so big. It's not only just hotels. You can start something on your own as well. Also. So that is the career advice that I have for, uh, for future uh, HSONians who would like to, you know, take up hospitality. As a career. Thank you so much to both of our panelists for all your enlightening answers. We're now going to our Q&A session with the audience, and we already have our first hand up. Um, Yasser Malik Saab, you can go ahead and ask your question. Oh, thanks, Dan. Um, hey, Nikki, how are you? Salam uh, Azam Saab. Um, thank you for having this session. Uh, I just have one. Uh, actually, I have three questions. So the first one is related to what sort of challenges are presented by Airbnb to the, like, the, I'm not just talking about the, um, hospitality industry, but overall the hotel industry because it's a direct threat. Second is what sort of developments or if there is any development being made in this specific niche of Airbnb in Pakistan. Um, and um, I, once you have answered this, third is, is completely a, of a different um, uh, trend. So I'll ask that uh, once, uh, once we get the answer for these two questions. I can repeat okay. myself. I'm sorry. I, I was trying to gather no, no. my thoughts. I've, 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 heard the, I've heard the question. You want me to answer, Ayman? Uh, sure, you go ahead. 
Okay, uh, my uh, my take on this is that Airbnb was a much larger threat pre-COVID than it is post-COVID. This is my take on it. And my argument is simple. Airbnb means allowing strangers in your house, okay? Now, with the pandemic and with the viruses, would you be comfortable in allowing strangers in your house? That, that is the question every Airbnb person needs to ask. Pre-pandemic, Airbnb was heading toward in a direction that it would have dented a lot of hotels. It was, everything was going Airbnb's way. Now Airbnb has taken a very big hit and for very simple reason. Airbnb means you allowing people in your home. Sometimes you are not home, but a lot of times you are home. So would you allow strangers to walk into your bedroom, touch everything, use everything? Um, and how, and then how much investment, like Naki said, you need to spend a lot of money to sanitize your home. So how much are you willing to do? How, how much money will you spend to sanitize that room pre-guest arrival and post-guest arrival? Uh, Hunza, for example, from Pakistan's reference, uh, people in Hunza and people in Skardu and all are all now working on the Airbnb level on a private level. Not They're not a part of Airbnb, but they're using the same concept. So if they have an extra bedroom, they, they've cleaned it up and they've made it into a decent bedroom and they invite guests and you can come from that room and you can pay us so many thousand per day. So that's already happening in Pakistan. It's They, they don't operate under the the brand, but they're doing their own Airbnb's level. So yes, Airbnb is a is a good concept. It will always uh, be a threat to the larger hotels, and that's why, like Naki said, that more economy hotels are coming up because they need to compete with Airbnb. And uh, but like I said, pre-COVID, Airbnb was going through the roof. Now. Uh, I'm not too sure. It will take a, a slight hit for the reasons that I've mentioned. Uh, thank you for that answer, Ji. Uh, we have another hand up from uh, Haq Nawaz Khan from the batch of 1994. You can go ahead, sir, and ask your question. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, this is Haq Nawaz, class of 1994. I'm based in uh, Orlando, Florida. So first of all, a oh, big thank God. you to the uh, esteemed uh, uh, panelists. Like, you're very honored. So just a brief background. About 10 years ago, I, I love hospitality and hospitality management, but I'm in IT. I had the pleasure of uh, running the IT operations for Westgate Resort, which is a timeshare company in Orlando. So I got tons of experience. And, and again, I live right behind Disney. So I noticed hospitality left and right. So the question is, I have a two-part question and totally. So one is, uh, again, I live in Orlando. I see all these international big name brands. So what are the channels, if, if, if available in Pakistan, for example, for some of the international brands to be there? Because right now, I mean, I was born and raised in Pakistan too. We only have PC, Marriott, Best Western, maybe some that I'm missing. But how were the days in, La Quinta in, some economy on other brands? Like, is there a channel for those brands to make it to Pakistan at all? And, and again, it's a very deep question, but just from a high level, uh, is there like a way for international brands to be in Pakistan? Okay, uh, Naki, you want me to uh, start and then you can... I, I'll just start and then you take over because I'll okay. just, just mention a point. Uh, uh thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's, a, it's a very nice frame question and this is a question that, you know, I've been always asking myself as well. We've had starts. So I know for a fact it's the Hyatt, um, uh, what you call Radisson, and a few other brands, they've actually invested in Pakistan and they wanted to open up hotels here. Sadly, we've had challenges. Like, for example, I remember about four years back, Hyatt asked me, Kibbe, would you like to go back to Pakistan? I said, are we opening hotels? So they said, yes, we're going to open up four properties and they're going to open up in Bahria. So the first challenge, what we were facing globally, do we have enough qualified Pakistanis who would actually be willing to be part of the core team of Hyatt who would open, be opening in, in Lahore? So first for project, I remember was the Hyatt agency in Lahore. Uh, that was next to the Serena there. And when I started looking up the entire company in Hyatt, which has 975 hotels, the Mushkel I could hardly get 15 or 20 qualified people. Okay, so that was the first thing. 
Secondly, construction of building and projects as well. I think there we are facing challenges because the, the specialist teams who are there, they're all based in a lot of different parts of the world. They are not willing to travel to Pakistan. So these two investors are willing to invest. There are people in Pakistan who want hotels. Uh, there are people who want to open up as well. But the biggest problem is that the chains are, you know, they're facing these challenges. One is that continuation of finding good, talented people. Secondly, do we have in people in Pakistan, uh, sorry, the corporate offices, are they willing to, because of the security and what they hear, the image of the country? That's where I think there, there's a challenge there and due to which we, have, we, have, we actually have a lot of hotels signed up as well. Unfortunately, we'll talk about it. Okay. Thank you. Asma sahab. sahab, would you like to add something? Yeah, just that, uh, dekhe, uh, there are a lot of small hotels that are running in Pakistan, right? Some even have the Ramada franchise, some have the Holiday Inn franchise. The question is, how much does it cost? Uh, a local owner of a 30-room hotel uh, is always looking at costs. And if the costs are prohibitive, then he says, Kiyar, I don't need Ramada. I can fill this hotel up on my own. You know, as long as it's clean, it's decent, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's well appointed. Uh, so there is this economy factor also, uh, the value for money. Uh, a lot of uh, owners I know who have international franchises, they are seriously thinking about giving them up. So it's not, now it's a franchise. It's not, it doesn't mean that what Naki is saying, sending people from abroad to work here, that's a management contract. I'm not talking of management contracts. Management contract, to mera hai, ab ek move in pick ka reh gaya, otherwise there's no management in the entire country. Everybody's on a franchise. Even the Marriott's are on a franchise. So when intercontinentals were here, that was a fully managed contract. That means every employee in every hotel was an employee of Intercontinental Hotel and not the owners. Now all the employees are of the owners. They are PSL employees. They are not Marriott employees, okay? But they have the Marriott visiting card. So it's all now up to economy. And post-COVID now, uh, cost management has become even more important. So you need to look at, Kiyar, if I put the days in uh, board outside my hotel, how much is it going to help me in terms of revenues? And how much is it going to cost me? And sometimes the costs are prohibitive. And then small owners say, no, I can do this myself. So yes, we would like international chains to come in. And like Naki said, I remember Hyatt was coming in and a lot of chains were coming in. Even now, every three months, it's like the soup of the day, a news break, so-and-so is coming and Hilton is coming. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll hear that and I just let it go because till I see it with my own eyes, um, I'm really not going to uh, start popping the champagne bottle over that. It's not going to happen. But bottom line is that uh, it's expensive. Getting an international brand is expensive. And once your revenues uh, justify that expense, by all means, people would love an international brand. But sadly, post-COVID, like Ahmed was saying, revenues are really struggling. You know, if you have 20%, 15% occupancy, uh, would you want to pay days in or would you want to pay holiday in a lot of money at the end of every month? That would really hurt you. So that's my uh, two cents on this. Sure. Thank you, sir. So you've given a good insight because uh, I've always tracked in this industry. So my second and last question, uh, my apology, is uh, this is in relation to entrepreneurship. So this is always the question, me being an expat, I always feel like investing in Pakistan, I have to be part of an Illuminati or some secret group because so so let's suppose in, uh, in America where I live, if you want to invest, you know, if you don't have the capital, you can pool in there. So many avenues that promote entrepreneurship. So is there some vehicle now or in the future in Pakistan where somebody, you know, somebody average like me or, you know, others out there, like let's say it's Sonians, like juniors who want to get there. So uh, what are the tools currently available and what will be in the future for entrepreneurship in hospitality uh, in Pakistan? Yeah, I think I this think question is for Azam Saab. So you can go ahead and answer. Okay. 
ओके देखे इट्स ऑल अबाउट नंबर ओके बैंक्स विल ओनली हेल्प यू इफ योर नंबर्स मेक सेंस सैडली हॉस्पिटैलिटी नंबर्स आर नॉट मेकिंग सेंस बिकॉज लैंड कॉस्ट यू नो जस्ट रियल एस्टेट कॉस्ट we when i was at cornell we we were told that you keep it around 15 20% of project cost today you go buy a piece of land it's 10 million dollars so you tell me what hotel are you going to build on that you know you need to go to back of beyond you need to get to 30 kilometers outside of lahore to to get some reasonably priced land now and if you make a hotel there who will stay there and come to lahore every morning in that traffic so it's a catch 22 position um this uh, right across the serena is a uh, is a, uh, a convention center okay now that convention center is over 10 acres and now the government is planning to privatize it okay they are saying when if private owners can come they can make a hotel here and they are asking 100 billion rupees 100 billion with a b okay not with an m so you tell me that if you spend 100 billion rupees on a piece of land explain to me what hotel will you make that will make you money uh, a lot of projects uh, and so urban land is now prohibitively expensive uh, i'm talking of urban land uh, you get outside the city the land obviously is less expensive but then logistically your hotel is not well uh, located then you can't expect businessman to stay in your hotel and commute 45 minutes into lahore he'll go nuts right and hence the pc guy and the avari guy are still within 10 minutes of the business district and everything so it's a cash 22 uh land prices are have become prohibitive that makes your feasibility uh unreal and if your feasibility is unreal then banks are very hesitant to finance you you know because you just can't and you can't charge 30000 for a room because every other hotel is going to charge one third of that so who's going to come to you so it's really uh, you know it's really a cash 22 i wish i had the answer for it but i really mm-hmm. so this is great sir so uh, my you. last comment here is a uh, uh, is actually like a thank you and an invitation to azam sahab and nakis sahab if you ever come to orlando hospitality is on me i'll show you inshallah my hospitality if you ever come to orlando <laughs> i can do that i can vouch for the colorado person i was in school in upstate new york and then i spent uh, a few years in in colorado because i used to live there but uh, and of course one has to go to uh, orlando which i've been but next time you're on so uh, we shall sir. tell amaz to rope you in and then we'll come and see you inshallah sir okay. be my i'll just add a small point um, events marquee business is something that i've noticed that you know i because i recently joined come to pakistan that it, it's a good trend over here as well and a lot of people are investing into making marquees they're opening their marquees they're opening events business as well and it's quite thriving obviously because of covid events have reduced but i think this is something in the future to look at because all the people that i've known who opened up marquees they eventually said that you know they've made they made a good amount of money some of them are based in pakistan some of them are abroad but they have tasked this to somebody that okay need to operate this as well and i think it's it's it, it's working in a very very nice manner as well also uh, if you are able to get hold of a small let's say a restaurant chain not doesn't have to be very big and then you are able to get the franchise there because the main cost is the franchise agreement how much the franchise is costing as well but if you are able to do so as well because if a good branded restaurant comes into pakistan i think definitely it has a good scope as well uh, both for the people as well and as, as for the restaurant also absolutely thank you sir thank, thank you thank you so much for those comments uh, i'm going to open the floor to more questions from other audience members i know you've been waiting patiently so if you have any questions now is the time please raise your hand okay i'll give you 10 more seconds <laughs> good nobody has any questions <laughs> um if if we don't have any questions then we can go to an optional networking session oh we have one question finally uh ji mohammad atif please go ahead 
yes thank you very much guys uh, for giving me this opportunity i am not actually from mrs and bad mr azam jameen has been kind enough to share the link so that i can attend this session uh, two simple questions please one is there a difference between hospitality or managing a, uh, managing a hostel hotel in an urban area and that in uh, some in northern areas one i'm talking about in the context of pc bhuban versus pc alpindi or any other city in pakistan number two uh, what are the factors that we need to incorporate while actually going for a franchise in pakistan a local franchise maybe or international franchise Please, who wants to take finance and sorry um, sir azam sir would you like to take uh, the questions okay okay yeah uh dekhe uh since i've uh, i was at uh, at pc and you mentioned uh, uh, pc bhurban now pc lahore and pc bhurban mein in terms of operations to farak nahi hoga but in terms of mindset farak hoga Uh, people you need to understand that your customer is different at bhurban you have the honeymoon lot and you have the people who are on vacation uh, would you uh, want to wear a three piece suit and come to pc bhurban or, or would you want to come in a casual uh, flowery bushirt with a nice white pair of slacks that gives the holiday look uh, when i was at serena um, you know my boss changed the uniforms of all northern area hotels and we said everybody is there on a holiday and stop looking like a businessman uh, it's a holiday hotel now so yes uh, the offerings change um, when at pc bourbon you have one factor that probably you don't have maybe in an urban hotel and that is kids and kids can drive parents nuts okay and so you need to keep the kids away from the parents so the parents can have a nice cup of coffee on the terrace without everybody uh, pulling their hair out so you need in your hotel you need more facilities for the children so at pc bourbon you have these game rooms and you have the movie house and you have uh, what you have or what you may it's uh, so you actually design a hotel based on your client base uh, in a business hotel Uh, for example the islamabad serena hotel it has a huge business center um, the gilgit serena does not have a huge business center it has one room with one uh, computer and that's it and you walk into uh, islamabad serena the business center you you know is huge obviously because the clientele is business oriented so these hotels in terms of service in terms of quality obviously you can't differ you need to look after your guests but the the nature and the culture of the hotel changes of based on where you are i ran a hotel in in steamboat springs colorado for for many many years and it was a ski resort and uh, it was the fourth largest ski resort in the world at the time in the 80s and i didn't have any restaurant in the hotel nobody wanted to eat in the restaurant everybody woke up in the morning they took their coffee and their donut and off they went to the ski mountain so so it's it's what your customers are you 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 operate according to that and i at if i have forgotten the second part of your question am i if you remember can you just run it by me again okay at if you can uh, repeat the question uh, please sir my second question was what are the factors to be taken care of while actually going for an international franchise or a local franchise in pakistan yeah uh at if the factors are very simple uh international franchises all have standards right hyatt has a set of standards if you make a hotel here and you invite hyatt to come and manage it or give you a franchise they they have just one parameter and they will check your hotel based on international hyatt standards if it doesn't meet those standards you will not get the franchise and if it does meet the standards then they can sit down and and speak to you so it all depends on what quality of hotel you've built and what franchise you are seeking if you've made an economy hotel and you are seeking a four seasons franchise you're not going to get it right or if you've made a very uh, you know economy hotel and you're looking at a ritz carlton franchise you're not going to get it 
So it all depends on what product you have and whether it meets with the standards of the party that you are wanting to come and give you their brand name. Sometimes, sometimes um, they recommend changes that you can do and then they will reconsider you for a franchise. But sometimes the changes you cannot do. For example, if your room size in square meters doesn't meet the height standard, you can't break the hotel down and make your rooms bigger, right? So you're stuck and you have to very politely decline or they'll very politely regret. Uh, so, but if they say we don't like the color of the carpet, uh, you know, it's, it's possible you can change the carpet, but you can't change the size of your bathroom because the hotel has already been constructed. So uh, it all depends on certain factors. You can do what they want. And on certain factors, it's totally impossible. So it all depends on what standards you meet with a foreign brand that they will say yes or no to you. Uh, just to uh, Amit, I'll just add one quickly point. Uh, Abhi, about franchising, I'll give you an example of Starbucks, for example. Abhi, Pakistan, we don't have Starbucks and people are quite surprised when they have, we don't have a Starbucks. So one of the reasons, so I've been working with Starbucks in Saudi and they told us to be, our concern is uh, what Azim Saab just said, to be, are there people willing to deliver the standard and the product and the services? That is that is what is required. They, they, they said we are willing to offer our coffee bills, for example, but we can offer it, we can pack it in a different way with your name and logo, but with our product. But with our product, you want to display the name, our logo, they're not comfortable with it. Burger cake, for example, it took a lot of time to come, you know, Burger King and some other brands, because of the mere fact is that they were concerned that we would be able to deliver the quality of meat what is being served outside consistently in Pakistan or not. So, these two things factors and Shiva said change are a little bit franchise, international franchises when they hesitate when they want to open up in Pakistan. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer, Ji. Um, now, thank you so much to our panelists uh, for taking our time from their busy schedules to speak with us. Thank you so much to the audience members for participating so actively. Uh, this is all the time that we have. And I'm going to be ending the meeting now. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks for another Zoom webinar on another topic with more uh, highly respected and accomplished alumni. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.